In this video, we'll take a look at three positions with respect to the free will debate. First, libertarianism. Second, hard determinism. And third, compatibilism, sometimes called soft determinism. It would be nice to believe in free will, but the problem is that when we look at the world around us, we see a physical world completely governed by physical laws. The motion of the planets, the growth of a blade of grass, the behavior of a chipmunk, all of these events are causally determined. That means that given the prior physical states and the laws of nature, things can only happen exactly the way they actually turn out. The problem in the free will debate is that determinism, which says that all events, at least those that occur on a macroscopic level, are entirely determined by past events and the laws of nature. So setting aside the findings of quantum physics, the physical events that we experience are entirely determined by past events and the laws of nature. And since our bodies are also physical things, then our bodies should also be governed by these laws of nature. And our behavior should be entirely determined by past events and the laws of nature. The first position we will examine regarding free will is libertarianism. Libertarianism says that free will is incompatible with determinism and we have free will. This position is not to be confused with the political position known as libertarianism. This libertarianism amounts to a rejection of determinism. So why be a libertarian? The principal reason is that it seems that it is truly up to us what we do. Imagine a woman who has misplaced her cell phone, has her car break down. If she pauses to reflect before deciding what to do, it will seem truly up to her whether she attempts to push her car or simply walks away to seek assistance. Now, given that in her circumstances one option seems far better than the other, perhaps it's easy to deny that she really has a choice here. If the woman realizes that one option is far better than the other, the position that she doesn't have a genuine choice in that situation is pretty easy to swallow. However, a more mundane decision might serve as a more instructive example. Suppose I see two burgers sitting on a windowsill, and that I am only hungry enough to eat one of them. And further suppose that there is no advantage or disadvantage in choosing one rather than the other. They have the same visual appeal, they are the same size, and one is just as easy to reach as the other. Now, if I were to stop to deliberate about which burger to choose, which I suppose is something that only a philosopher might do, it seems truly up to me whether I choose the burger on the left or the burger on the right. And it being truly up to me seems incompatible with determinism. The hard determinist agrees with the libertarian that free will is incompatible with determinism. However, the hard determinist also maintains that determinism is true. So if Barry takes his dog for a walk and sees a cat stuck in a tree, it will seem up to Barry whether he rescues the cat himself or calls a friend that he knows won't mind rescuing the cat instead. But if determinism is true, it seeming as if it is up to Barry which decision he makes is just an illusion. If determinism is true, one of these options is not a real alternative for Barry. So why is it just an illusion that Barry has a real decision here, that it is up to him which option he chooses? It is not up to us what happened 10 million years ago, before we were even born. And it is also not up to us what the laws of nature are. But if determinism is true, then what we do now is the product of what happened before we were even born and laws of nature. Therefore, the decision we make is not really up to us. 
One important assumption that a hard determinist makes is that the kind of free will necessary for moral responsibility requires that it really be up to us what we do. But compatibilists challenge that assumption. Compatibilism is the view that we have free will and determinism is true. Here's an interesting example in support of compatibilism. Suppose that Nancy is the kind of person who gets sadistic pleasure from stranding cats in trees. And one day, Nancy spots a cat in the park near a tree that happens to have a ladder leaning against it. Because Nancy wants to enjoy that sadistic pleasure, she decides to strand the cat in the tree. There's a very interesting detail about this story, which is that Judy, who seems to be innocently pounding on her laptop, is actually quite determined to see Nancy strand the cat in the tree. If Nancy looked prepared to pass up the opportunity, Judy would use a gun to ensure that Nancy does indeed strand the cat in the tree. But as the story goes, Nancy strands the cat for her own sadistic pleasure and Judy does not even need to show her weapon. So, given that Judy will compel Nancy to strand the cat in the tree, if Nancy does not choose to do so on her own, it is not up to Nancy whether she will strand the cat in the tree. And yet, if Nancy strands the cat for her own evil reasons, we would hold Nancy responsible for her action. If it is not up to Nancy whether she strands the cat, and she is morally responsible for stranding the cat, then compatibilism is true. Do you find this argument compelling? Or is there an idea in the reading assignment that you think deals a crushing blow to compatibilism? Hi. Today's topic is on interest groups, so I have stationed myself on K Street, a main street in Washington, D.C., which happens to have a lot of office buildings where many of the major lobbying firms are located. K Street has become an expression in Washington, uh, meaning the lobbying industry, such as the K Street crowd won't like this, and so forth. Interest groups, also known as pressure groups, sometimes known as lobbies, are an integral part of the political process. Interest group activity is an expression of public opinion, or at least the opinion of that group, which is why we focus on it here in this general segment unit about public opinion. People join interest groups because they want to advocate their opinion, and they believe that they will have more clout if they band together rather than acting as isolated individuals. And they're probably right. Now, interest groups are a part of politics that have, I think, something of a bad reputation. We generally don't like interest groups, except those that we're members of. They're okay. But we think that interest groups sometimes use undue political influence, maybe even illegal. They seek things that help their grubby little special interest, but undermine the general good. There's also the criticism that not all interests are represented in the interest group system, and that's probably right. I'd say, though, that most parents would probably not smile if they asked their child, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the kid said, I want to be a lobbyist. Most parents probably would hope that you'd be something else. But for whatever reasons, there are thousands of interest groups, and they are growing. Over the last several decades, the number of interest groups, however you measure that, has grown. They're organized around a shared interest. Many are organized around business or economic concerns. There you would have your business interest groups, labor unions such as the AFL-CIO, professional associations such as the American Medical Association and the AMA. Another large group or body of groups are, around, are organized rather around specific issue concerns such as the NRA and other associations that are for or against more restrictions on gun ownership, the Sierra Club and all the other environmental organizations all around, organized around an issue concern. Then another major grouping are based on group identity where the group is organized around gender, race, 
ethnicity, or in the case of the 37 million members of AARP, age. Well, here's my membership card. I'm a member too. You know, not only does this help advocate for the interest of older people, it also gets you nifty discounts at motels and car rental companies and so forth, and believe it or not, a free donut at Dunkin' Donuts. Such a deal. As I said earlier, not every interest is organized, and this is a criticism of the interest group system. Interest groups are based on money. Money equals strength. Numbers count. Money equals strength. Many interest group activities cost money. If you want to make campaign contributions, that costs money. If you want to hire a lobbyist to represent your interest, they expect to get paid. If you want to take people out to wine and dine them, someone's going to pick up the check, and it's going to be the lobbyist. Interests that don't have a lot of money are at a disadvantage in the interest group system, so it's not a perfect expression of democracy. But it is a valid way that many interests do get to put their preferences into the mix. Interest group activity is organized, most people say it's organized around inside lobbying. I'm sitting home today on a Sunday afternoon, waiting for this snow to go away. I have a feeling by the time we view this video, snow will be long gone. I want to take a moment to talk about assignment for the second week of class. As you'll see, you have all been assigned to one of five groups, a great thinkers group. There are many great thinkers or persuasion pioneers um, who have led to the development of this field of study, and you are assigned to do some research on one of them. And you can see they range the gambit from Aristotle to Burke to Hovland to McLuhan and to Maslow. There are many others that could have been on this list, but those are the, the five um, we decided to go with for this course. So what you want to do is to research the person to whom you are assigned and learn as, as much as you can about them. You'll find that there are myriads of numbers of sources out there that you can choose from. And then what you'll do is carry on a conversation within my courses with people who are assigned to your great thinker as well. So we have four students who are Hovland, four students who are Maslow, four students who are Burke, four students who are Aristotle, four students who are McLuhan. And I'll be posting a series of questions throughout the week every other day, which will help to kind of prompt your focus to investigate these great thinkers along the lines of persuasion-oriented uh, questions. It'll make sense as we go along. The fun thing about it is that when you're done, you'll have a really good sense of how this person would have reacted to questions about persuasion in the digital age. All of these people are long gone now, and uh, Perhaps they saw the internet coming, but they weren't here to see it actually uh, uh, develop. And uh, what we want to do is really be able to understand the best we can about how we think these people would have reacted to questions about persuasion in the digital age. We'll carry on with more of those questions next week. Hi, this is Sean. In this video, I'm going to go over a layered workflow using the Maya Mila material, which is new in Maya 2015. So let's get started. Uh, there's been a bunch of layered workflows that have been used for the last several years. One, uh, in terms of using the Maya Mia material, uh, there is one where you can hook up the Material X into different surface shaders and then drop them into a layered shader, and that seems to work pretty well. There's another one using the Color Mix node. Um, there's other uh, useful reading that uh, I would recommend using the Maya Help Docs 
there's a recommended mental ray for Maya Shader's help doc, and then there's also the Mia Material help doc. Let me quickly just flip to those. Have those open. Here's the recommended mental ray for Maya Shader's help doc. And it's pretty short, but it goes over some recommendations for what some of these different shaders are for. And then also uh, what's some of my students had some questions about the different bump mapping parameters that are listed. There's a um, overall bump and I mean, it's really useful to read this whole doc, but it's pretty long, but it's a good reference. Uh, and this is even the old one that I just grabbed offline. Um, let's see what else. There's also a mental ray blog uh, that's really useful and that uh, within the mental ray blog there's a, a fairly uh, a post that came out in April that goes over it discusses a lot of the um, Mila material and a workflow. So all right, let me go back to my PowerPoint and uh, in terms of the workflow that I'm going to be using, I'm going to be going off of the color masking workflow that I uh, presented in my last video uh, with one sort of minor addendum or difference in Photoshop. I've got that open. I mean, I sort of made some adjustments. I made a new object uh, that's a little bit faster, less materials. Um, also, one thing to point out, too, that I put my... Uh, layers inside of uh, folders inside of Photoshop and that's that will help uh, Maya identify the PSD layers so um, okay so let's uh, keep going uh, in terms of the thought process the idea is that uh, in, for, for a long time it's been known that you know the fewer materials that you have in your scene the better Basically, um, you know, there's the switch node that's inside of Maya that's been in there forever, um, which will allow you to use less uh, shaders in order to achieve multiple um, objects, uh, multiple looks. Uh, also, there we're sort of moving into the realm of physically based materials, which have a balanced energy input and output, um, and so with the the implementation of the Mila material that takes us one step closer to this um, where we're sort of using less uh, materials but then when we're using physically based materials that's where it gets a little bit complicated in terms of saving rendering time and that's uh, sort of the promise that Mila material will um, sort of allow you to save render time uh, and here's the sort of thought process that I went through um, basically, uh, you can have weighted layers in the Mila material where you have, you know, several different, uh, different specific types of materials and they're discrete, uh, where you can also like go in with the Mila materials. You can have mixed materials within one material, um, and as well as other materials. And you can have different layers for refraction and different layers for incandescence and uh, trans uh, transparency. Uh, but in terms of like layering it all up, then the you know sort of you could sort of put a wrapper on top of everything, and you could always you could sort of go towards a top material mask, and that that material mask could be rust or dirt, and this could be sort of an idea for how you might want to think about your you know developing your materials. What I want to take a look at are some additional truth tables. This follows conditional and biconditional statements. So for the first one, we just need four lines in the truth table because we only have two variables. So we start out with P and Q again. P being two that are true followed by two that are false. Q alternating true false. Then the left-hand side is P or Q. Remember, again, in a disjunction, it's true when one or both of the two disjuncts is true. So it would be true, 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 false. The right-hand side is the negation of 
P or Q, which is the opposite truth value, F, 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 T. And then we put these two together with a conditional. Remember in a conditional, the only time in which a conditional is false is when you have a true hypothesis and a false conclusion. So T implies F would be false, T implies F is false, T implies F is false, F implies T is true. And this concludes the first truth table. Let's go to the second one. We have three variables, P, Q, and R. We're going to put them all at the very beginning. P with four that are true, followed by four, four that are false. Q is two that are true, followed by two that are false. And R alternates TF. Then we have a bracket on the left-hand side. We're going to do inside the bracket with the parenthesis first, which is P and Q. First two columns, they both have to be true for it to be true. So that would be true, true, and then false the rest of the way down. Now the entire bracket, which is P and Q, or R. So now we're taking the third column, the fourth column, and if it's true in either of those two columns, it would be true. So true, 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 false, true, false, true, false. In the first part of our course, we are looking into the elements and mechanisms of ritual, how rituals are put together and how they operate. We just finished examining ritual symbols and symbolic action. This week, we'll delve more deeply into two other elements of the ritual experience, imagery and embodiment. Our readings will take us to Nepal and Haiti. We've seen that ritual is a deeply complex human activity involving bodily movement, the manipulation of symbols, and all of our senses. One important element of ritual, though, is one that cannot be seen, and that is mental imagery. Very often in ritual, participants are guided by way of chants and songs to envision certain things and to imagine themselves as part of that imagery. Guided imagery is a term often given to this process in which ritual participants are intentionally guided so that they envision a certain set of images often including images of them being healed by spiritual forces. What impact does this guided imagery have on the participants, their experiences, and their interpretations of their experiences? Guided imagery is a very common element in healing ceremonies that are led by traditional healers known as shamans. Guided imagery has also been adopted and elaborated by a new set of healers in the United States and elsewhere who did not grow up with these shamanic practices. In this unit, we will also consider embodiment, which is a term used for bodily movement and experiences felt through the body. Embodiment is a defining element of all rituals and what makes rituals so special among the different elements of social and cultural life. Ritual always involves the orchestrated movement of bodies, things such as standing, sitting, kneeling, turning around, holding things aloft, marching, lying prostrate, washing, wearing special clothes, bowing, dancing, going into trance, these are common embodied experiences in ritual. Rituals involve all of the senses, which include the five senses that we commonly talk about in the U.S. Sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. But also other senses, including the sense of balance, vestibular sense, 
the feeling of one's body in space, proprioception, the feeling of pain, nociception, and the sense of temperature, thermoception. We want to consider how the various bodily movements and sensations in ritual affect the minds, moods, beliefs, and perspectives of the ritual participants. One question we will be asking ourselves in this topic is how much does ritual depend upon imagery as compared with embodiment? Does the participant's experience of the ritual depend more upon what he or she sees and imagines, imagery, or upon what he or she experiences through bodily movement and the other senses? Or is it possible that different rituals work in different ways, some placing more emphasis on imagery and others privileging embodiment? To explore these questions, you will read two different articles and compare them. Our first reading for this topic takes us to Nepal. You will read Robert Desjardins' article on Healing Through Images, the Magical Flight and Healing Geography of Nepali Shamans. Desjardins' article follows up directly on Driver's notion of the transformative power of ritual. In this video, we will be demonstrating how to use the ohms functionality of the multimeter as well as working to wire up the circuit we need for laboratory number one. I presently have a breadboard next to the multimeter and on top of the breadboard I have hooked up a resistor from D1 over to I1. So if you recall from the previous video, between A1 and E1, there is an electrical connection, and between F1 and J1, there's an electrical connection. So I'm going to power on the multimeter, which will boot up in the DC volts mode, as we've previously seen, and I'm going to toggle the button with the omega, which now puts this in the mode to read units of resistance, or ohms. Because this particular element has been wired up already, I'm going to come in and read its value. So it reads as a 0.993 kiloohm resistor, or approximately a 1 kiloohm resistor. I'm next going to measure the value of a second resistor before I hook it up. And you can see here that this resistor is approximately equal in value. It is a 0.99 kiloohm resistor. To wire this in series, I am now going to press one lead in J1. And I'm going to move this, oops, I'll put that back in J1. And I'm going to move it between J1 and we'll make it J15 just to make this uh, kind of stand out here for the video. So hopefully you can see that I am now moving this down the J column. So as I hook the two of these together, I should see that we have some kind of connection. So let's start with the first resistor. If I just directly measure its resistance, it shows up as about one kilo ohm. As I measure the second resistor, it shows up as about one kilo ohm. So because we have the two of these now hooked up in series, let's see what happens when we measure between both leads. I now have something that is approximately two kilo ohms because these resistors are hooked up in series. We're going to add a third resistor here, and I'm going to intentionally make this one go down uh, vertically as well. And this is a 0.98 kilo ohm resistor. So we're going to hook it up in series with the other two. So we're going to begin by connecting it in the same row as the second resistor. I'm going to make this one go a little bit shorter just because of the zoom that I have on this camera. I'm going to zoom this out so you all can see this a little better. So here is the other resistor. And we're going to now read the total resistance between all three of the resistors, which should now be approximately three kilo ohms. And that's what we see.
So in this example, we'll be calculating the centroid of a 3D volume using the composite method. So the first thing that we need to do is pick a coordinate system. In this particular problem, we're actually given one. You can see the X and Y and Z locations in this figure. Now this is an interesting shape in that we see triangles, we see a rectangle, uh, but clearly those two triangles are offset from the origin of the coordinate system and we need to keep that in mind. So we begin by understanding the centroid equations and what we need to calculate. So the centroid equations for three orientations x, y, and z are shown here for a given volume. So we're going to need to know the x centroid location for each segment the volume for each segment, and that volume for the segment will be both in the numerator and the denominator of these equations. So it's a good idea to start by calculating the volume since we'll be using that repeatedly. For volume 1, it's straightforward. The dimensions of the rectangle are 2.5 meters by 1.8 by 0.5. And the two triangular volumes are just half of its rectangular dimensions 1.8, 1.5, and 0.5. Okay, welcome back everybody. This is the second lecture in the installment of the history of modern Japan. Uh, before we get started today, uh, Wolfgang the History Hound has a service announcement for you uh, uh, regarding some due dates in the course. So, uh, Wolfgang, do you want to uh, let the students know things that are coming up? Sure, Michael, I am happy to do that. First of all, everybody should remember that the first quiz of the class is this week, and it will be happening Friday at 5 p.m. And you are going to take that quiz on your own. And it is, as you know, a short answer. So there will be a series of questions, and you will have to answer in sentences and paragraphs as you need. We will talk more about the format of the quiz a little later. Also, you should know that the paper is also due Friday at 5 p.m. That paper should be in the Dropbox uh, that I will open up on my courses. Um, I will post a my courses tutorial so that you will know how to use it when the time comes. So please uh, drop your paper into the Dropbox and the parameters of the paper are on the syllabus. So please read that and if you have any questions, you should send them to Michael and he will be happy to answer them. Please also remember that your reflection piece on the woodblock prints are due on Wednesday by 5 p.m. also on the discussion part of my courses. And Michael will open that uh, very, very soon. So you should post your reflection on the woodblock prints, which are in the content section of my courses. And you should also reply to at least one other of your colleagues reflection pieces in a real way not a trite one sentence reply but read and respond in a thoughtful way michael over to you all right thanks wolfgang that's uh, very very helpful um so please remember to do that you'll also know of course that uh, you should be keeping up with your reading since the quiz will uh you know, more or less be a reading check. So make sure you're, you're doing that. Okay, so uh, let's move on here. Okay, so uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the world uh, scene as we uh, examine Japan in what we might call the early modern period. Historians talk about the early modern period uh, up to about the 19th century. Um, and Japan, in, at this point, was really shaped by uh, two world developments and, and two empires, I suppose, if you want to put it that way. One was the expansion of Russia. Russia was expanding gradually throughout the uh, 17th century towards the Pacific Ocean. 
uh, and they were setting up trading posts in places like Kamchatka and some of the Pacific Islands. And in fact, they were uh, exploring uh, Hokkaido, this northernmost island uh, in Japan. And that really served to uh, alarm the Japanese. Uh, and in fact, it made the Japanese start thinking about uh, their northern islands in a way that they really hadn't before. In fact, they, they treated their northern islands as foreign uh, territories. Uh, but they started thinking about these northern islands in a way that they hadn't before. And that was spurred on largely by Russian expansion. In a certain sense, we've been climbing up a mountain to the uh, Boltzmann distribution. So uh, let's try to recap where we've been. So uh, let's see. Here's doggone it. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So I need uh, my mountain drawer here. So the mountain is going up like this. Um, and at the top of the mountain, there's, um, you know, a little flag up here. Flag says... Um, uh, P is proportional to E to the minus E over KT. And they have little uh, cards you can buy there, little uh, cards. And then, of course, for much of the career of a physicist, you can uh, ski down the mountain. Here's some skis. And um, there's a skier with the poles, you know, all his mathematical methods and everything. And of course, he's very happy to um, be skiing down the mountain. And there we go. Whee! And uh, he's carrying little placards of Boltzmann distribution. They're a little too small. You know, they're, he can read them, but you don't have to read them. You have to just know he's going down the mountain, and um, so uh, and you've been climbing up the mountain uh, with your hiking boots here, you know, here's a hiking boot, here's another hiking boot, um, you know, one of the hiking boots says N factorial is asymptotic to N log N minus N, and, um, uh, and there are various slips along the way, you know, things like Physics classes, uh, and then there's um, uh, problem sets, and uh, you come to the top, and I have to draw a picture of what you see at the top. At the top, I'll just uh, you know say so we can zoom in here. It's amazing how you can zoom in with these, this technology these days. Uh, you zoom in, and what you're going to see at the top is, lo and behold, a, um, a, a swimming pool. You see a swimming pool at the top. There's a swimming pool. It's sort of like Camp David. I think they have a. I, they ought to have a swimming. Pool. If they don't have a swimming pool up there, maybe you should write to the president or something like that. And um, uh, at the side of the swimming pool are uh, physics students. Physics students are red. You didn't know that? Well, now you do. Physics students are red. And, um, and physics students like to sit at the side of the, f at the pool, and they drop pennies into the pool. So. Hi everyone. I love this conversation about identity. It really takes us to some more personal areas and raises some interesting questions because we begin to think outside of our comforts and how we communicate with others through different media, you know, verbally or textually. But also, we think about how technology may play a role in our actual identity creation and presentation. So we're taking a bit more of a psychological look at things this week. Let's start by doing this. We all use symbolic markers, things that we use to represent ourselves to others. Look down at what you're wearing. 
right? What, do you, what does your outfit say about you, about who you are, your personality? My outfit hopefully says I'm a professional. Um, I care about how I look in these videos to you. Um, you can't see it, but I, I'm wearing pants. So even though you can't see my pants, I'm, they're still there, <laughs> right? But how do we present ourselves to others online? I'll start with me. I have different pictures for different things, right? You can tell my Facebook pictures, my more professional LinkedIn style, the sassier Instagram. These different pictures are all saying different things about me. They're showing different parts of my identity, what I want shown in these different platforms. Now let's take a look at some of you. I searched some of your Facebook pictures and I uh, got to see how some of you might present yourself online. Many of you have the nice straight solo picture, but some of you chose something a bit more representative of your current identity. Whether it's having someone else in the picture with you or showing yourself at a great locale, these are all ways that you are representing a part of your identity to others. A few things to think about as you do your readings this week. Really, let's start with what is identity? I look at identity as a way of making sense of things, a structured, coherent story about who we think we are, how we might answer the question, who are you, or tell me about yourself. Why do we need to construct an identity? Just to answer those questions, or to learn more about ourselves and how we will or will not behave or react in certain situations? Is this construction natural or social? Can it be both? What about multiple identities? I showed you a few shades of Tracy that highlight different identities that I might align with. I could be the serious professor, the fun-loving mom. Is one identity more real than the other? Some people more easily create and maintain diverse, ident diverse identities. Researchers talk about these different selves, whether this is always conscious or not is up for discussion. Welcome to week seven, video one for copywriting and visualization. This week we're talking about headlines. Wait, something's wrong. Where's my head? Oh no. Is it important to have a head? Yeah, just the same way it is it's important to have a headline. Of course you've got to have a head. Without a good headline or a good head, no one will know what you're talking about. Oh no, oh no, something's going on. Oh, wow, I've got my head back. Seems to fit okay. Wow, that's a good thing, maybe. Um, and that's kind of my way of saying, you know, a head has to be a good fit. It has to do a lot of work. It has to be the most important part of your ad. And so therefore, if you don't have a great headline, or head as it's sometimes called, you're probably not going to have an ad that works. Did you know that 8 out of 10 people will read a headline, but only 2 out of 10 will then go on to read what's after that headline? That's why it's so important that the headline be powerful and enticing. Whether you're writing copy for advertising, a headline for a magazine or a newspaper, that headline, those first words, are so important. And remember, the only job of any piece of copy that you write is to get someone to read the next piece of copy. So that's particularly important with a headline. So the headline's job is to get people to read the next piece of copy. Could be a line of body copy. That should lead to another line of body copy and so on until you get to the call to action. Remember that's the thing at the end of the ad that tries to persuade consumers to do something, whether it's a phone number, a web address, so on. It's why in this course you won't do a lot of writing per se but you will do a lot of rewriting because rewriting and rewriting and rewriting is how you perfect that copy to make it as powerful and as effective as possible. So how do you come up with a great headline? Well, if I had to give this particular video a headline itself, it might be something to the effect of 10 things you must do to get a great headline. Did you see what I just did? Was there something in that headline that grabbed your attention? Maybe it was the 10 things, 
or maybe it was you must do or maybe it was the phrase great headlines what I actually did was I incorporated three things into one headline that would grab your attention the first part has a number at the start and then I threw in a couple of words like must and great that are sure to get your attention in this way I put together a very quick headline that is going to grab some attention your book is full of great advice on how to write a headline. It talks about things like parallelism and puns, and I strongly encourage you to make sure you really understand what those things are, and if you have questions, please bring them to class. But where do you start? That's the key. Where do you start? What's the very first thing you should do before you even think about what direction you would like to take the headline in? Well, a simple exercise is this. Imagine you are at a restaurant or a bar, you're sitting there, and someone walks up to you and asks, what are you working on? Imagine this is someone you really want to impress. Without even thinking, you're likely to sort of spout off a sentence, maybe two, very quickly, that will sum up all your thinking about the product that you're trying to write some copy for. And really, what you've just done without thinking about it is summarize everything that needs to be in that headline. And that's a great way to do this. If you can, have someone ask the question, so what are you working on? And then you, without looking at any other reference materials or anything that's in front of you, just say whatever comes to mind. And in that moment, you'll most likely have some of the key words that you need for that headline. Write them down. This list of words, this list of ideas is where great headlines will come from.